Welcome back to Plato's Republic. We're going to start book eight today. If you are just joining us, check out the description. I'll have a link to book number one and all the other books. Uh, for everybody else, so you remember book seven, we had the allegory of the cave, one of the most famous passages in all of philosophy and probably one of the coolest visual images too. So remember we got these guys in their fetters looking at a wall and there's like a fire behind them, but between them and the fire, there's this low road and these puppeteers with all kinds of objects made of sticks and wood and stone and whatnot. And they basically put on a puppet show and all the prisoners, these strange prisoners, as they're called, uh, think that the shadows are the real thing. And so they have words for each shadow and each shape, and they kind of know which shadows come before which other shadows or which shapes come before other shapes. And then you got some guys doing the voice acting so that they think the sounds come from the shadows. And one of these guys manages to break free. I don't know how he gets past the puppeteers exactly, but he goes out into the light of the sun, of the real sun. And he is, his eyes aren't quite ready for it yet so he kind of starts out looking at shadows outside the cave and then looks at real objects outside the cave and then finally can see the sun itself his eyes get adjusted so that when his when he goes back into the cave uh he actually can't see as as well as before because his eyes are used to the light outside and so of course it's all an allegory that's why they call it the allegory of the cave and socrates says that Really, everybody is kind of inside the cave except the true philosopher who has seen reality with the light of the good. So the good is what illuminates everything, and the, I guess the dialectic is his vision outside of the cave. And that somewhat uh, or put, throws a little bit more light, as it were, on his ideas about different types of thought. So he had, like belief and knowledge and opinion and imagination and thought and understanding. Uh, so we talked a little bit about that magic quadrant uh, describing the four of those. And they're discussed in relation to the ideal education of the philosopher. So Socrates says that you gotta, you can't learn uh, the dialectic um, at a young age. You, you kind of need uh, physical education first you need to learn these four magic subjects, which uh, end up being mathematics, geometry, music, and astronomy. And these kind of give you, give you some education that will be useful later, for example, in war, but also are appealing to the soul, or the, this idea of the summoners that somehow involves the soul in a way um, that the, the sort of the lower levels of these subjects or other subjects uh, don't involve. Uh, so his, his example is like you look at a finger, it's a finger, but you look at a number and it makes you contemplate the nature of numbers in this kind of abstract way. And he says that that abstract thinking is useful in war in ways I don't really understand. Um, and it's going to be kind of good for the, this future philosopher's soul. He lays out the ideal education. So it's like you have physical training for a couple years. I think you study all this stuff for like 10 years. And then when you're 30, you begin to learn the dialectic. That's when you're finally ready for disputation. And you do that for five years. And because you, you don't want to teach the 17-year-olds this stuff because they're just going to be kind of obnoxious. Um, and then, then you go into like regular political service. And this, is, this he calls going back down into the cave. So he's like, the true philosophers, they need to be trained and to see the sun, but then we got to force them back down there uh, to help the people out. So after 15 years back down in the cave, um, they become philosopher kings. And I guess there's like a group of men and women uh, who make the rules for the society, and when they depart, they depart for the Isle, the isle of the Blessed. And that's, I think that's a complete description of his city. So we had, in the first few books, or like three through five, we kind of had the ideal city described. And then we started getting into this metaphysics and talking about philosophy and the, the difference between the philosopher and the philodoxer. I think that was the end of book five. 
And now he's kind of fleshed out what he really means by philosophy. And it is someone able to kind of contemplate the good, even though he doesn't say what the good is. He just says that philosophers using the dialectic can reach the good. And then they can use that um, in, or, in order to run the city and, and, I guess, bring it about. So he talked a lot in previous books about how, how it's, it's at least possible you'll have some prince who will study philosophy and put this whole thing into action. Uh, or the, maybe the philosophers will like, be able to persuade the people um, that it's a good idea to put them in charge. <laughs> Whether it actually is, it remains to be seen. Um, but that's, that's kind of, I think, I think we have his complete theory of the city at this point. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what else you add here. We've discussed pretty much every profession in the city. Um, we've discussed the family. We've discussed people coming into power. Um, I don't really, I don't really know. You know. We've discussed warfare, going to war with these barbarians, and uh, kind of trying to be nicer to other Greeks. So I don't, I don't know what's left. Uh, well, we will find out here in book eight. So get comfortable and let's go. Book eight. Socrates narration continues. All right. We are agreed then, Glaucon, that if a city is going to be eminently well-governed, women must be shared. Children and their entire education must be shared. In both peace and war, pursuits must be shared. And their kings must be those among them who have proved best both in philosophy and where war is concerned. Okay, so kind of going back to, I guess, books four and five, talking about the guardians, how they, yeah, share, share their women and children, and they don't really know who their biological children are. We are agreed, says Glaucon. Socrates, moreover, we also granted this. Once the rulers are established, they will lead the soldiers and settle them in the kind of dwellings we described earlier, which are in no way private, like these barracks, but wholly shared. And surely, we also came to an agreement, if you remember, about what sort of possessions they should have. I think none. Yes, I do remember. We thought that none of them should acquire any of the things that others now do. But that, as athletes of war and guardians, they should receive their minimum yearly upkeep from the other citizens as a wage for their guardianship and take care of themselves and the rest of the city. Okay. That's right, says Socrates. But since we have completed that discussion, let's recall the point at which we began the digression that brought us here so that we can continue on the same path again. Okay, so I, I guess... I don't even remember what the digression was exactly. Maybe it was the nature of philosophy. Glaucon, that is not difficult. You see, much the same as now, you were talking as if you had completed the description of the city. Look at a footnote here. I think I'll tell us which book we're talking about. Uh, no, nope, doesn't give me the book reference. 445 something something. You were saying that you would class both the city you described and the man who is like it as good, even though it seems you had a still finer city and man to tell us about. Wait, there's an even finer city? Okay, I, I don't know, because we kind of gotten two versions of this. One is the Guardians are running the place, and then when he's talking about bringing it about, he's like, oh, actually, we need the Philosopher Kings in place. But in any case, you were saying that the others were defective if it was correct. And you said, if I remember, that of the remaining kinds of constitution, four were worth discussing, each with defects we should observe, and that we should do the same for the people like them in order to observe them all, come to an agreement about which man is best and which worst, and then determine whether the best is happiest and the worst most wretched, and whether it is otherwise. I was asking you which four constitutions you had in mind when Polymarchus and Adiamantus interrupted. Oh, yeah. Because I think it was, it was in the end of one of these books, maybe book five, he's like, and there are five types of cities. And he names two of them, and then that's it. And that is when you took up the discussion that led here. Okay. Is that, no, where was that? Is it going to tell us? Is this going to be another useless footnote? 449. So useful. Okay. Socrates, that's absolutely right. Like a wrestler, then, says Glaucon, 
Give me the same hold again, and when I ask the same question, try to tell me what you were about to say before. If I can. In any case, I really want to hear for myself what four constitutions you meant. Socrates. It won't be very difficult for you to hear them. You see, the ones I meant are the very ones that already have names. That's handy. The one is praised by the many, your Cretan or Lacon Laconian constitution. The many, is this democracy? I.e. Spartan. Nope. The second, the second in the praise it receives, is called oligarchy, a constitution filled with a host of evils. Antagonistic to it, and next in order, is democracy. Okay, we've got the one praised by the many. So we've got a Spartan constitution, oligarchy, democracy, and noble tyranny, surpassing all of them, is the fourth and most extreme disease of cities. Okay, is that like the enlightened monarch? Can you think of another form of constitution? I mean, another distinct in form from these? Four, no doubt, there are di dynasties and purchased kingships and other similar constitutions in between these, which one finds no less among barbarians than among Greeks. Okay, so he's saying we got, like, these four types of constitutions and there are ones in between, but these, this, you know, maybe it's another magic quadrant, like, which corner are you closest to? Many strange ones are certainly mentioned, at least, says Glaucon. Are you aware, then, that there must be as many forms of human character as there are of constitutions? And he's, he's made this comparison countless times between the just man and happy man and the just city and unhappy city. Or do you think constitutions arise from oak or rock, and not from the characters of the people in the cities, which tip the scale, so to speak, and drag the rest along with them? Glaucon, no, they could not possibly arise from anything other than that. Socrates, so, if there are five cities, there must also be five ways of arranging private individual souls. <laughs> of course, Socrates. Now, we've already described the one who is like aristocracy, the one we rightly describe as good and just. Okay, that, I don't know if he used, did he use that word before? I feel like I've seen it, but... When he's been describing it, he hasn't said, like, oh, and the ideal aristocracy. It's always been the ideal city. Because <laughs> aristocracy has kind of a bad name these days, but, you know, just trying to keep order around here. Glaucon, yes, we have described them. Socrates, mustn't we next describe the inferior ones, the victory-loving and honor-loving, which correspond to the Laconian constitution? Okay, the Spartan one. They just, they love, I guess, military honors followed by the oligarch oligarchic, democratic, and tyrannical, so that, having discovered the most unjust of all, we can oppose them to the most just and complete our investigation into how pure justice and pure injustice stand with regard to the happiness or wretchedness of the one who possesses them. Okay, well, I think we're, this brings us back to book two. We're looking, remember, we're looking at, like, Robo Hitler and Angel Gandhi and comparing them. And so we, now he's going to compare the cities instead because everything will be analogous or analogous to uh, the individual soul. Okay, and be persuaded either by Thrasymachus to practice injustice or by the argument that is now coming to light to practice justice. Okay, we're getting to the final showdown here. Um, so we're finally addressing Thrasymachus correctly. Or he says, he says we finally have the tools to address that question of whether it's better to lead a life of injustice. Um, so remember the key argument was you need to seem like you're just and receive all the honors, but you need to actually be unjust and cheat on your taxes. Glaucon, that's exactly what we must do. Socrates, then just as we began by looking for the virtues of character and constitutions before looking for them in private individuals, thinking they would be clearer in the former, Shouldn't we first examine the honor-loving constitution? Okay, I, I guess we're just going to look at these four constitutions in turn, so this, this, this might take a while. I do not know another name that is commonly applied to it. It should be called either Timocracy or Timarchy. <laughs> yeah, it's like go government by Tim. Vote for Tim. Then shouldn't we examine that sort of man by comparing him to it? And, after that, 
oligarchy and the oligarchic man, and democracy and the democratic man. Fourth, having come to a city that is under a tyrant and having examined it, shouldn't we look into a tyrannical soul and so try to become adequate judges of the topic we proposed for ourselves? Okay, so this, well now we got the strategy. We look at how happy the souls are after looking at how happy the city is. Glaucon, that at any rate would be a reasonable way for us to go about observing and judging. Socrates, come on then, let's try to describe how timocracy emerges from aristocracy. Or is it simply the case that, in all constitutions, change originates in the ruling element itself when faction breaks out within it? But that, if this group remains of one mind, then, however small it is, change is impossible. Okay, I'm going to do a couple things here. First, I'm actually going to look up democracy dictionary. A form of government in which possession of property is required in order to hold office. Or, a form of government in which rulers are motivated by ambition or love of honor. Okay. Seems like the appropriate word. I guess we're, we're using the second meaning here. Okay, so then he says, so there's, this is the honor-loving Spartan constitution. Let's describe how this actually comes to be. And this, this is something he's done a few times. Like, how is this, like, how is the ideal Callipolis going to come to be? Oh, we need a philosopher king to do it. Um, the, great, the great becoming. Okay, so how, how does that happen? So it's, he says, we're going to need faction, because if the group remains of one mind, however small it is, change is impossible. So we got again, we're preventing faction. So I think basically we don't want the, the ideal aristocracy to descend into timocracy. And if there's, so if there's faction in the aristocracy, then it'll decay. Glaucon, yes, that's right. How then, Glaucon, will our city be changed? How will faction arise either between the auxiliaries and the rulers or within either group? Remember, this, this whole thing was about preventing faction. That's what the whole mythology was about. That's what his whole theory of justice is about, is reason, spiritedness, keeping appetites under control. Everybody agrees that that's how it should be, and everybody subscribes to like the dominant mythology. Or do you want us to be like Homer and pray to the muses to tell us how faction first broke out? and have them speak in tragic tones, playing and jesting with us, as if we were children and they were speaking in earnest. <laughs> yeah, I wonder, wonder how he's going to come down on this one. How do you mean? Something like this. It is difficult for a city constituted in this way to change. However, since everything that comes to be must decay, not even one who's so constituted will, not even one so constituted will last forever. Ah, okay, so he's saying... Things are either eternal or they're not. If this ideal city comes into being, then it, it like it kind of has the seeds of its own destruction in it somehow. On the contrary, it too must face dissolution. And this is how it will be dissolved. Not only plants that grow in the earth, but also animals that grow upon it, have periods of fertility and infertility of both soul and bodies each time their cycles complete a revolution. These cycles are short for what is short-lived and the opposite for what is the opposite. So long-lived for what is long-lived. However, even though they are wise, the people you have educated to be leaders in your city will, by using rational calculation combined with sense perception, nonetheless fail to ascertain the periods of good fertility and of infertility for your species. Instead, these will escape them, so they will sometimes beget children when they should not. No, he's okay. So he's quoting somebody. Who's he actually quoting? I guess this is Homer praying to the muses. Okay, I don't know. So he's and still in quotation marks. Now, for the birth of a divine creature, there is a cycle comprehended by a perfect number. While for a human being, it is the first number in which are found increases involving both roots and powers comprehending three intervals and four terms of factors that cause likeness and unlikeness, cause increase and decrease, and make all things mutually agreeable and rational in their relations to one another. Of these factors, the base ones, four in relation to three, together with five, give two harmonies when thrice increased. One is a square, so many times a hundred. 
The other is of equal length one way, but oblong. One of its sides are 100 squares of the rational diameter of 5, each diminished by 1, or alternate, alternatively 100 squares of the irrational diameter, each diminished by 2. The other are 100 cubes of 3. This whole geometrical number controls better and worse births. What in the hell is this guy talking about? This reads like parody. Okay, I'm going to look at the footnote just for some... Okay, so this guy actually works out the math. You want to go through the math together? Go through the math. Go through the math. Yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. Put... Okay, get excited. Skip ahead if you don't like math. I mean, I might give up partway through. The human geometrical number is the product of 3, 4, and 5 thrice increased. So if 3 times 4 times 5 times 3 times 4 times 5 equals 3 times 4 times 5 squared is 1 increase, 3 times 4 times 5 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 3 times 4 times 5 equals 3 times 4 times 5 raised to the 4th is 3. This formula inc included increases involving both roots and powers. 3 times 4 times 5 is a root. Its indices are powers. It comprehends three intervals sim symbolized by multiplication in four terms, namely the roots. The resulting number, 12,960,000, can be represented geometrically as a square whose sides are 3,600 or an oblong or rectangle whose sides are 4,800 and 2,700. One, that is the square, is so many times 100, 36 times. Two, that is the oblong, is obtained as follows. The rational diameter of 5 is the nearest rational number to the real diameter of a square whose sides are 5. This diameter, square root of 5 squared plus 5 squared equals square root of 50 equals, equals 7, roughly. Since the square of 7 is 49, we get the longer side of the rectangle by diminishing 49 by 1 and multiplying the result by 100. This gives 4,800. The irrational diameter of 5 is square root of 50. When squared equals 50, diminished by 2 equals 48, and multiplied by 100, this 2 is 4,800. The short side, 100 cubes of 3 equals 2,700. The significance of the number is more controversial. The factors that cause likeness and unlikeness, cause increase and decrease, and make all things mutually agreeable and rational in their relations to one another are probably the numbers, since odd numbers were thought to cause likeness and even one's unlikeness. This is the stupidest thing I've ever read. Of the numbers significant in human life, one is surely the 100 years of its maximum span, another might be the number of days in the year, roughly 360, and a third might be the divisions of those days into smaller units determined by the sun's place in the sky, since it is the sun that provides for the coming to be growth and nourishment of all visible things, assuming that those units are three, the 360 degrees of the sun's path around the earth, a suggestion due to Robin Waterfield, thank you Robin Waterfield, the number of moments in a human life that have a potential effect on its coming to be, growth and nourishment, would be 100 times 360 times 360, or 12,960,000 Plato's human geometrical number. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, number of mo- what? I don't- I- uh, what? Okay, you have 100 years times 360, that's the number of days, and then the extra 360 is the degree in a day if we're turning in the sun's path around the earth. Then that's just like the number of times you can have sex in your life? I don't know. Human life can have a potential effect on its coming to be, growth how many be growth and nourishment? Okay, maybe not just sex, but that's how many moments that, that there are, I guess. If you divide a day into 360, I don't know. It's like rent. <laughs> what is that? 9,600? No. 925,600 Nine, minutes? Is that right? That's the same sort of crap he's talking about. So this is 12,960,000, the magic number. Okay, now this is, this is the sort of crap philosophy I thought would be more prevalent in this book, where he's just, like, making up stuff about numbers. This is like numerology, like, oh, and then you make the square, and you make the oblong, and you make this, and that's, that's this magic number, and then this magic number corresponds to this, and then you subtract two, and then, 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 and then um... And there's 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 no, there's literally nothing to it. Like <laughs> this is not recognized by modern science. Um, 
But and I don't. He's he's still in quotation marks, so maybe he's making fun of this. I'm not sure. Because most of the other times, like, it hasn't been that bad. Like, it hasn't been that bad. It's it's been a little weird. Like the the idea of the good being accessible through thought, um, but it's not not too crazy. Okay, so this person keeps saying, and when through ignorance of these your guardians. Join brides and grooms at the wrong time, the children will be neither good-natured nor fortunate. The older generation will choose the best of these children, even though they do not deserve them. Ah, okay. And when they, in turn, acquire their father's powers. I mean, this happens... You got these generational patterns that happen all the time, and are just one of the biggest determinants of how society is shaped. I had this great professor in grad school who said... Uh, he got his... Like, he got a basically a tenured job before he finished his PhD. This is like in the 60s. And he said, what do you think the explanation for that was? And people were like, I don't know, you're smart. He's like, yeah, I was God's gift to the earth. And he says, just kidding, there were a lot of baby boomers and they couldn't hire professors fast enough in the late 60s because they had so many people to educate. So you could be a complete moron, but if you happen to be finishing your PhD in like 1968, you would get an awesome job and just paid extremely well. And so... I, I think he's saying similar things here. It's like, it's pretty hard to, to time these baby booms, and they might end up screwing your complete, like, screwing your society up. Okay. All right, so when they in turn acquire their father's powers or businesses, the first thing they will begin to neglect as guardians will be us by paying less attention to musical training than they should. And the second is physical training. Hence, your young people will become more unmusical, and rulers chosen from among them won't be able to guard well the testing of Hesiod's and your own races, gold, silver, bronze, and iron. The intermixing of iron with silver and bronze with gold will engender lack of likeness and unharmonious inequality, and these will always breed war and hostility wherever they arise. We must declare faction to be of this lineage wherever and whenever it arises. Glaucon, and we will declare that they have answered correctly. They must, says Socrates. They are muses, after all. Okay, so this big number is pretty stupid, but the rest of this, I think, I think makes sense to me. It's like, you have a huge baby boom, and it puts strain on all your social resources, and then maybe they're not getting the education that they actually deserve. Because, I don't know, you got overcrowded schools, so like, start cutting the music budget, start cutting the physical education budget, uh, and then you got people in power who aren't properly educated and that kind of sows the seeds of society's destruction um you'd think like i don't know the philosopher king would take care of this and be like okay here's how like here's our baby quota we gotta we gotta meet that this year but I, he's saying it's just inevitable they, they always screw up this calculation okay glaucon what do the muses say next socrates when faction arose each of these two races, the iron and the bronze, pulled the constitution toward money-making and the acquisition of land, houses, gold, and silver. The other two, by contrast, the gold and silver races, since they're not poor but naturally rich in their souls, led toward virtue and the old political system. Striving and struggling with one another, they compromised on a middle way. They distributed the land and houses among themselves as private property, enslaved and held as serfs and servants those whom they had previously guarded as free friends and providers of upkeep and took responsibility themselves for making war and for guarding against the ones they had enslaved okay so i i think basically it's like the baby boomers screwed everything up and led to this mixing of races and that led to factions because it's not a just society anymore and now they kind of kind of have the civil war and then it says they they compromise on this middle way so they the lower races or the iron and bronze races are striving after land and houses and so they distribute that as private property and then they held as serfs and servants those who would I, I don't know who they're enslaving exactly and then they're took responsibility themselves for making war. So I guess this is the uh, bronze and iron races are taking responsibility for making war, for guarding against the ones they had enslaved. 
So whoever whoever those free friends are are now enslaved, and now you got to guard against them instead of just guarding against the outside. Okay. So the society's collapsing. Glaucon, I think that is how the transformation begins. Socrates, wouldn't this constitution then be somehow in the middle between aristocracy and oligarchy? So I guess I guess this new kind of decayed aristocracy. Of course. Anyway, that's how the transformation occurs. But once transformed, how will it be managed? Or isn't it obvious that it will imitate the first constitution in some respects and oligarchy in others since it is in the middle between them, and that it will also have some features unique to itself? That's right. In honoring the rulers, then, and, and in the fighting class's abstention from farming, handicrafts, and other ways of making money, in providing communal meals and being devoted to physical training and training for war, and all such things, won't the Constitution be like the previous one? Okay, so, so I guess you have a, the new fighting class, and they're sort of the same as the old fighting class. Falcon, yes. But... In its fear of appointing wise people as rulers, on the grounds that men of that sort are, not lo on, are no longer simple and earnest, but mixed. In its inclination towards spirited and simpler people, who are more naturally suited for war than peace. In its honoring the tricks and stratagems of war, and spending all its time making war. In these respects, by contrast, isn't it pretty much unique? Okay, so it's because they've had this mixing and stuff, I guess... This inclination towards spirited and simpler people. Um, yeah, they don't. They don't have. They they don't want philosopher kings anymore. Is all, and that that makes it different. Falcon, yes. I think it's going to be a pretty boring chapter. Such men will have an appetite for money, just like those in oligarchies, passionately adoring gold and silver in secret, owning storehouses and private treasuries where they can deposit them and keep them hidden, and. They will have walls around their houses, real private nests, where they can spend lavishly on their women or on anyone else they please. Okay, so these new guardians like money and spend it. That's absolutely true. They will be stingy with money since they honor it and do not possess it openly. Okay, they got kind of, yeah, they got secret wealth, Panama Papers. But they will love to spend other people's money because of their appetites. They will enjoy their pleasures in secret, running away from the law like boys from their father, since they have not yet since they have not been educated by persuasion but by force. Uh, that yeah, I remember that came up with you can't have compulsory education for philosophers because it it won't stick. This is because they have neglected the true muse, the companion of discussion and philosophy, and honored physical training more than musical training. The constitution you are describing is a thorough mixture of good and bad, says Glaucon. Yes, it is mixed, but because of its mastery by the spirited element, only one thing that really stands out in it, the love of victories and honors. Okay, so to put it in the other context, remember we had like rational and spirited cooperating to be in charge of the appetites. Now it's like the spirit is in charge, but the rational is nowhere to be found, so they, they have their appetites. Uh, running away a little bit. And very noticeable it is. That, then, is how this constitution would come to exist. And that is what it would be like. It's just an outline sketch of the constitution in words, not an exact account of it, since even from a sketch we will, will be able to see that the most just man and most unjust one. It would be an incredibly long task to discuss every constitution and every character without omitting any detail, no kidding. Yes, that's right. Who, then, is the man corresponding to this constitution? How does he come to exist, and what sort of man is he? Hmm. Adiamantus. Oh, Ad Adiamantus is butting in. I think he would be very like Glaucon here, at least as far as the love of victory is concerned. Would you say about me? Maybe in that respect, but in the following ones I do not think his nature would be like that. Which ones? Socrates, he would have to be more stubborn and less well-trained in music, a lover of music and of listening, yet not at all skilled in speaking, the sort of person who is harsh to slaves instead of looking down on them as an adequately educated person does, gentle to free people and very submissive to rulers, a 
a lover of ruling and of honor, who does not base his claim to rule on his ability to speak or anything like that, but on his exploits in war and anything having to do with war. A lover of physical training and of hunting. Okay, so a jock. Yes, that is indeed the character belonging to this constitution, says Adiamantus. As regards money, too, says Socrates, wouldn't someone like that look down on it when he is young? But as he grows older, wouldn't he love it more and more because he shares in the money lover's nature and is not pure in his attitude to virtue since he lacks the best guardian? What's that? Reason, mixed with musical training. You see, only it dwells within the person who possesses it as the lifelong preserver of his virtue. And we sort of got that with the definition of justice. Um, but... Yeah, then it's it's mixed in with this sort of soul training, or the musical training and the physical training are for soul improvement. Virtue. Well put. That, then, is what a Timocratic youth is like. He is like the corresponding city. Okay, so the, the jock, it's kind of the bad jock who only wants honors and doesn't care about anything else. Not, not necessarily a great team player. Yes, indeed, says Adimantus. And he comes to exist in some such way as this. Sometimes he is the young son of a good father, who lives in a city that is not politically well governed, avoids honors, political office, lawsuits, and all such meddling in other people's affairs, and is even willing to be put at a dis disadvantage so as to avoid trouble. Yeah, but how does he become democratic? At first, okay, this poor, this poor fallen youth see what his story is. It first happens when he listens to his mother complaining that her man is not one of the rulers and that she is at a disadvantage among the other women as a result. This is so specific. Next, she sees that he is not very serious about money either. Does not fight or exchange insults in private lawsuits or in the public assembly. Is this all going to be mom's fault? But takes easily everything of that sort. Has a mind always absorbed in his own thoughts and does not overvalue her or undervalue her either. As a result of all those things, she complains and tells her son that his father is unmanly and too easygoing, your father, and makes a litany of the other sorts of things women love to recite on such occasions. This is amazing. And Eumontus, yes indeed, it is just like them to have lots of such complaints. Socrates, you know then that the servants of such men, the ones thought to be loyal, also say similar things to the sons in private. Okay, so this is... This is how the, yeah, we have the version of democracy coming from aristocracy with, like, the mismatch fertility rates. Um, and now we've got the individual version of that, which is you're, you've got a, like, dad, you know, beta male dad, I guess, who's not trying to run for office. And the mom is not happy with that. And once, once a stronger husband and starts kind of complaining to the son about that. And then the servants are going to say similar things. If they see someone who owes the father money, or has wronged him in some other way, whom he does not prosecute, they urge the son to punish all such people when he becomes a man, and be more of a man than his father. And when he goes out, the boy hears and sees other, other similar things. Those who do their own work in the city are called fools and held to be of little account, while those who do not are honored and praised. When the young man hears and sees all this, then, and on the other hand, also listens to what his father says and sees his practices from close at hand and compares them with those of the others, he is pulled by both, his father nourishing the rational element in his soul and making it grow, the others nourishing the appetitive and spirited elements. Okay, so maybe this is like accountant, you know, just accountant dad doing his job, not getting enough credit, kind of letting things go if he's wronged. And everybody else kind of makes fun of this guy for not being enough of a man. And, because he is not a bad man by nature, but has kept bad company, he compromises on a middle way when he is pulled in these two directions and surrenders the rule within him to the middle element, the victory-loving and spirited one, and he becomes a proud and honor-loving man. Okay. Eddie Montes, I think you have exactly described how such a man comes to exist. I love this because this is like deep psychology. This is like Freud here. Saying this, it all kind of comes back to childhood and your parents' relationships, and you trying you like respect your father, but you kind of want to 
be different from your father. Like, you see your father's shortcomings, and so you're like, okay, I'm not going to just uh, turn to, like, Epicureanism or just try to, to turn to the appetitive element or letting the appetitive element rule. But I, I do want to be respected as a man in my community the way dad isn't and win the love of my mother, so I'm going to, like, let the spirited element rule. This is so interesting. Socrates. So, we now have the second constitution and the second man. We have... <laughs> oh, man. Socrates. Next, then, shall we, like Aeschylus, talk of another man ordered like another city, or follow our plan and talk about the city first? The latter, of course. And I suppose oligarchy would come next after such a constitution. And what kind of political system do you mean by oligarchy, says Adimantus? Socrates. The constitution based on property assessment, the one in which the rich rule and the poor man does not participate in ruling. I, okay. Oligarchy, rule by the rich. I understand. So, mustn't we first to describe how timarchy is transformed into oligarchy? Okay, so this is... I guess you start from aristocracy and then degenerate down the ladder. Adimantus, yes. And surely, the way is transformed, the way it is transformed is clear even to the blind. How? Not clear to me. That storehouse filled with gold we mentioned, which each possesses, destroys such a constitution. Okay, so this is the democracy. It's like they want private property, uh, so they have these secret gold storehouses. Oh no, yeah, okay, each one has a gold storehouse that they use for their, in order to feed their appetites. And, okay, so see, he says, first you see, Democrats find ways of spending their money, then they alter the laws to allow them to do so, and then they and their women disobey the laws altogether. Okay, because they're like, oh, we just love honor, but really, we got, we got this secret stash here. And then they're like, oh, let's, let's change the law. Let's, let's, we can, we can just set up our stuff in Bermuda or something. Adimantus, probably so. Socrates, next, I suppose, through one person seeing another and envying him, they make the majority behave like themselves. Probably so. Okay, so yeah, we got these people kind of taking charge with their secret cash. Then they start spending their cash in public and disobeying the law. Everybody else notices, and then they start disobeying the laws too, I think. They've, got, they've gotten kind of demoralized. After that, then, they become further involved in money-making. And the more honorable they consider it, the less honorable they consider virtue. Or isn't virtue so opposed to wealth that if they were set on the scale of, balance, of a balance, they would always incline in opposite directions? Okay. It certainly is, says Adiamantus. So, when wealth and the wealthy are honored in a city, virtue and good people are honored less. Mmm, isn't, isn't that some food for thought? When wealth and the wealthy are honored in a city, virtue and good people are honored less. Yeah, do you, who do you see on the front of People magazine? Is it a rich person or a virtuous person? At Imantis, clearly. And what is honored is always practiced, and what is not honored, neglected. Yes. So in the end, Victor, victory-loving and honor-loving men become lovers of making money and money lovers, and they praise and admire the wealthy man and appoint him as ruler and dishonor the poor one. Ah. Okay. I can, I can see it. I can see it. They, start, they get a little taste of money. Then they start worshiping money. Then they put the rich guy in charge. Really, really rich. Bill, elect a billionaire. Eddie Montes, of course. Isn't it then... That they pass a law, which is a defining characteristic of an oligarchic constitution establishing a wealth qualification, higher where it is more oligarchic, lower where it is less so, and proclaim that anyone whose property does not reach the stated assessment cannot participate in ruling. And they either put this through by force of arms or else, without resorting to that, they use intimidation to establish this sort of constitution. Isn't that so? Okay, so they, they add a property requirement. And that's just because they worship wealth so much I guess all right Adimantus yes it is but what is it what is the Constitution like what are the defects we said that it had 
Socrates, first of all, consider its fi defining characteristic. I mean, what would happen if ship captains were appointed like that on the basis of property assessments and a poor person was turned away even if he were a better captain? Adimantus, people would make a very bad voyage. Socrates, and doesn't the same apply to any other sort of rule whatsoever? I suppose so. Except of a city? Or does it apply to that of a city too? Yeah, we got... There's the, the ship captain metaphor where he's, he's like, oh yeah, I'm just a philosopher who's considered a useless stargazer. But you guys are using all these other qualifications. Um, before it was just like, I don't know, knife fighting skills would determine who the captain was. Now it's like who the wealthiest is. Eddie Montes. It applies to it most of all since it is the most difficult and greatest kind of rule there is. Socrates, that then is one major defect in oligarchy. So it seems. What about this one? Is it any smaller than the other? Which? That a city of this sort is not one, but inevitably two. The city of the poor and one of the rich, living in the same place and always plotting against one another. Oh yeah, remember that? Um... He talked about that when he's talking about the city going to war with other cities, book three maybe. And he said that these other cities, the non-ideal cities, were properly more than one city. Because they had multiple factions. And the one, the city that was one city would be able to like split up the factions. And I kind of gave, I gave the example of like the Confederate states during the American Civil War. The Union was like, hey, slaves... Don't you want to not be a slave anymore? Join our side. Uh, so that causes their weakness, and that uh, causes their collapse, I think. I think that's where he's going with this. But Edimontes, by Zeus, that's no smaller a defect. Socrates, and this is hardly a good quality either. The likelihood of being unable to fight a war because of having to arm and use the majority, and so having to fear them more than the enemy or else, because of not using them, and so having to show up as true oligarchs on the battlefield. And because, at the same time, the fact that they are money lovers make them unwilling to pay mercenaries. <laughs> I like that. Okay, it's like they're so cheap, they love money so much they don't actually want to spend it. I mean, I'm not hiring a mercenary. That's, that's, that's my money. Okay, so he's saying, that, yeah, they don't want to fight because they'd have to arm the majority. Like, uh oh. Yeah, and I guess in the case of the set, like, American South would be like, oh, are we going to actually arm the slaves? Like, I'm, I don't think that's a good idea. Or they don't use them, and so having to show up as true oligarchs on the, on the battlefield. True oligarchs. I don't know what that's about. I.e., as being few. Oh, it's a, it's a joke. Being few in number. It's like, well, yeah, either. We arm the majority, or we go to battle ourselves, and there aren't that many of us, or we hire people, and none of, like we don't want, we don't like any of these outcomes. Adiamantus, that is not good. And what about what we condemned long ago? The fact that this, that in this constitution there is the meddling in other people's affairs that occurs when the same people are farmers, money makers, and soldiers simultaneously, or do you think it is right for things to be that way? Yeah, that was kind of his definition of justice, which tied into how you'll be, a, like, if you're a farmer and a soldier, you'll be worse at both. And it's just better to specialize, and that's why we got the Guardians. Not at all. Now, let's see whether it is the first to admit the greatest of all evils. Which is? Socrates, allowing someone to sell all his possessions and someone else to buy them, and then allowing the seller to continue living in the city while not being any, more, any one of its parts. Neither moneymaker, nor craftsman, nor ca cavalryman, nor hoplite, but a poor person without means. Okay, so let's see. It allows someone to sell his possessions and someone else to buy them. Okay, and just kind of being a, a pauper. Eddie Montes, it is the first. Anyway, this sort of thing certainly is not forbidden in oligarchies. And yeah, big homeless population. I mean, if it were, some of their citizens would not be super rich and others totally impoverished. <laughs> like how this translation uses super rich. That's, super has just become this completely academically acceptable adverb. Okay. Adimantis, that's right. Now consider this. 
When a person like that was rich and spending his money, was he then of any greater use to the city in the ways we have just men mentioned? Or did he merely seem to be one of the rulers, while in fact he was neither ruler nor subject of it, but only a squanderer of property? <laughs> yeah, you worthless guy. That's right, says Adi Montes. He was, seemed to be a ruler, but was nothing but a squanderer. That's what happens when you love money too much. Do you want us to say of him, then, that as a drone existing in a cell is an affliction of, to the hive, so this person existing in a household is a drone and affliction to the city? Yes, indeed, Socrates. I mean, there, there again, Socrates does not like people spending money. It's like, he's like, you can't have too much. If you're too rich, you're just going to get lazy and not be good at your job. Same if you're, as if you're too poor. Got to gotta have just the right amount of wealth and the right amount of poverty. Yes, indeed, Socrates. And as in the god, Adiamantus, made all the winged drones stingless, as well as some of the footed ones, while other footed ones have terrible stings. <laughs> this guy knows a lot about bees. And don't those who end up as beggars in old age come from among the stingless ones, while all those with stings are called evildoers? Goodness gracious. Okay. So you we got stingless drones. End up at, like... I guess if you're fierce, you're an evildoer, and if you're not, you become homeless. That's absolutely true. Clearly then, in any city where you see beggars, somewhere in the neighborhood there are thieves hidden in pickpockets, temple robbers, and craftsmen of all such sorts of evil. Okay. Or is this... Oh, no, okay, these are... These aren't the... The rich people aren't evil, so it's... If, you're, if you lose all your money, and people in these oligarchies lose all their money, they either become beggars or they turn to thievery and temple robbing and pickpocketing. Clearly. What about oligarchic cities? Don't you see beggars in them? Nearly everyone is, apart from the rulers. Mustn't we suppose, then, that there are also many evildoers there with stings, whom the rulers forcibly keep in check by their cautiousness? We must certainly suppose it. Yeah. Yeah, watch, watch out. Those cities with extreme wealth and equality might be a lot of pickpockets there. Socrates. And aren't we saying that the presence of such people is the result of lack of education, bad rearing, and a bad constitutional system? We are. Well then, that is roughly what the oligarchic city would be like. It would contain all these evils, and probably others as well. <laughs> That's pretty much it, says Adiamantus. Let's take it then that we've disposed of the constitution they called oligarchy, which gets its rulers on the, on the basis of a property assessment. Okay, next let's consider how the person who is like it comes to exist and what sort of person he is when he does. Okay, so we've talked about aristocracy and the ideal version of it. It becomes timocracy because of the screwing up the fertility calculations. Um, you get the baby boom, then you get faction, and then people take charge who just love honor. But then kind of on the sly, they like spending money, and then you transform into an oligarchy because you allow, you start to authorize the spending of money, and then you have it so people can sell all their possessions and become homeless, and or you, I guess you have the property requirement thrown in there somewhere, and then you get these bad leaders put in place because you have the property requirement. Um, I, I think... This might also be Socrates being mad because he doesn't have any money. So he's like, yeah, if there were a property requirement, you couldn't put me in charge. So your city's going to collapse. Um, and then, yeah, you got a lot of poverty. And then you either have beggars or, like, the evil beggars become pickpockets. And then I don't think we actually show its collapse here yet. So I think we'll have to do that next, maybe. Um, and then, yeah, more importantly, they're like, they don't like going to war. So I think that could be out. I think they might just get taken over because the oligarchs don't want to fight themselves. And then they don't want to arm the masses because when the masses get guns, <laughs> they might just take over the place. And then they're too cheap to hire mercenaries, which might be my favorite little detail. Okay. So now that we've talked about the city version of that, we're going to talk about the individual version of that. I Hopefully with, like why the person was unhappy in childhood and how it's all his parents' fault. Okay. Edimantis. Yes. Let's. 
Socrates, doesn't the transformation from Timocrat to oligarch mostly occur in this way? Which? So I think this is the, at the individual level. Okay. <laughs> can't, can't wait for this story. Socrates, it happens when a son of his is born who begins by emulating his father and following in his footsteps and then sees him suddenly crashing against the city as against a reef and sees him and all his possessions spilling overboard. Okay, so remember this Timocrat, it's like you got this boring dad who's just Mr. Rational and kind of a pushover. His mom's all mad because, you know, her husband's a pushover and the servants are kind of making fun of him. And so then the son is like, I'm not going to be a pushover. I'm going to be a Timocrat instead. And I'm going to be spirited and lift a lot of weights. And nobody's going to push me around. And then I think it, it's the son of that guy, the son of the Timocrat. So it's like he, he starts out like emulating his father, who has been kind of ambitious. And then his father crashes against the city, sees him in all his possessions spilling overboard. He had held a generalship or other high office. So, yeah, this is the ambitious uh, one was brought to court by sycophants and was put to death or exiled or was disenfranchised and had all his property confiscated. This is so specific. This is incredible. I love this, like, multi-generational story. It's like Absalom, Absalom. Uh, yeah, so we got the father, the grand grandfather was just a nice aristocrat, and then the son was a timocrat, and then his son, was, like, sees... Democratic dad losing all his stuff or being put to death, and I guess is going to turn to, toward money making. Eddie Montes, probably so. Anyway, my friend, after seeing and experiencing all that and losing his property, the son is afraid, I imagine, and immediately throws the honor loving and spirited element headlong from the throne in his soul. And humbled by poverty, he turns greedily to money making, and little by little, saving and working, he amasses property. Okay, so he's got money, and then he loses it all, and he's mad about it. He's like, I'm just going to go earn this back. Don't you think that someone like that will then establish the appetitive and money-making element on the, that throne and make it a great king within himself, adorned with golden tiaras and collars and Persian swords? So specific. I do. And I suppose he makes the rational and spirited element sit on the ground beneath it, one on either side, and be slaves. Okay. Oh, and remember, money-making and appetites are tied together, because like, <laughs> that's how you afford to feed your appetites. Buy those pastries. He won't allow the first to calculate or consider anything except how a little money can be made into more, or the second to admire or honor anything except wealth and wealthy people, or to love being honored for anything besides the possession of wealth and whatever contributes to it. You know what I'd love to see would be the novel, like, the epic novel version of this exact tale of... Uh, yeah, intergenerational psychology and mirroring these uh, types of cities. Maybe someone's done it before. I actually probably wouldn't read it if they did, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. It's I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to know if it were out there, is all I want to say. I, might, I would even link to it in the video description here. Get a, get a referral bonus when you buy it. Okay. All right. So he just loves that money. At Montes, there's no other way to turn an honor-loving young man into a money-loving one than is as swift and sure as that. Isn't then this then the oligarchic person? At Montes, well, he certainly developed from the sort of man who resembled the constitution from which oligarchy came. Then let's see whether he resembles it. Let's. Wouldn't he resemble it primarily by attaching the greatest importance to money? Okay, so now we're comparing these two, these two fellas, or the fella to the city. Of course, Socrates. And also by being a thrifty worker who satisfies only his necessary appetites and spends nothing on other things but enslaves his other appetites as pointless. Okay, so I, I thought he was spending all this money, but maybe he's just amassing it. Oh, yeah, yeah, because it's just like the, the oligarchy didn't want to spend money on mercenaries. So I guess he's just feeding his, only feeding his necessary appetites just so he has, like, a big bank account. Okay, I, I don't know. I, maybe I misread part of that before. Eddie Montes, yes indeed. A pretty squalid fellow at any rate who tries to make a profit from everything. A treasury builder. The sort the majority admire. 
Isn't that the sort of man who resembles this sort of constitution? Oh, okay, 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 okay. So he's not actually spending money on those pastries. He is just, yeah, just squirrel, squirreling it away. Because uh, he, he saw his father go into poverty. He's like, I'm not, I'm not going to be like dad who lost all his money. I'm going to keep it. Eddie Montes. I certainly think so. At any rate, money is honored more than anything else by both the city and the one who is like it. Because I don't suppose, says Socrates, someone like that has paid any attention to education. Yeah, just... That's what happens if you're just obsessed with the dollar. Eddie Montes. I don't think so. I mean, if he had, he would not have chosen a blind leader for his chorus and honor him most. Oh, that's a metaphor. Socrates. Well put. But consider this. Wouldn't we say that though, dr though the dronish appetites exist in him because of his lack of education... Some of them beggars and others evildoers. They are forcibly kept in check by his general cautiousness. Ah, okay. So we had the beggars and evildoers in the city. Now we got beggars and evildoers in this oligarchic soul or person. And those are the appetites. We got some begging appetites and some evil doing appetites. It's kind of clever. Um, but the cautiousness. So it's I guess the rich people kind of keep them in check. Or, yeah, cautiousness, because he doesn't actually want to lose his money. Adiamantus, certainly. Do you know, then, where you should look to see the evils such people do? Uh, I don't know, the casino? Where? Where they are guardians of orphans, or any other situation like that, where they have ample opportunity to do injustice. Interesting. Okay. So, <laughs> I don't know. They adopt an orphan, and they just, like, try to take its money? It's like a Dickens novel. Adimantus, true. Socrates, so, doesn't that make it clear that in, in other contractual matters, where someone like that has a good reputation and is thought to be just, something good of his is forcibly holding in check the other bad appetites within, not persuading them that they had better not, nor taming them with arguments, but using compulsion and fear because he is terrified of losing his other possessions. Adimantus, exactly. Socrates, Yes, by Zeus, my friend, you will find that most of them, when they have other people's money to spend, have appetites in them akin to those of the drone. Ah, okay, so it's it's only fear of losing their own money that's stopping them. So as soon as they get their hands on other people's money, they're like off to Atlantic City in the liquor store. Adiamantus, indeed you certainly will. Socrates, so, someone like that would not be entirely free from internal faction, would not be a single person, but somehow a twofold one, although his better appetites would generally master his worse appetites. Okay, yeah, this, this guy's got a lot of strife going on in there. That's right. Because of this, I suppose someone like that would be more respectable than many other people, but the true virtue of a single-minded and harmonious soul would somehow far escape him. Yes, that's what he's talking about. Okay, Edimontus, I suppose so. so he just, it just looks like he's got everything together, but really he's having crises and going to his therapist a lot. Okay, Socrates. Furthermore, the thrifty man is a worthless individual con contestant in the city for any prize of victory or any of the other fine things the love of honor craves. He is unwilling to spend money for the sake of fame or other such results of competition, and, fearing to arouse his appetites for spending by allying them with love of victory, he fights in true oligarchic faction, fashion with only a few of his resources and is mostly defeated, but remains rich. Okay, so he's like, I would go after honors, but I don't want to spend too much money. And if I win, I might lose my, like, it might go to my head, and I might just start spending money left and right, like if I'm a famous athlete. And, yeah, be, be like one of those guys who you're like, how are you $50 million in debt? famous athlete like how does that even happen so he, he sees that and wants to avoid it so he just he mostly just gets defeated Eddie Montes exactly Socrates are we still in any doubt then that as regards resemblance a thrifty money maker corresponds to an oligarchic city this chapter is actually kind of fun I, I thought it'd be really boring but I, I like these little psychological studies Eddie Montes not at all then democracy it seems must be considered next both the way it comes to exist and what it is like when it does, so that when we know the so that when we know the character of this sort of man, we can present him for judgment in turn. Okay. At any rate, says Adimantus, that would be consistent with what we have been doing. 
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop here because uh, we had, I guess, four constitutions and we've, or five constitutions, yeah, we had five constitutions including aristocracy. So what do we have? We had aristocracy, timocracy, uh, oligarchy, democracy, and tyranny. So we've covered the first two, or the first three really, but in this chapter we talked a lot about timocracy and we talked a lot about oligarchy. So I'm going to save democracy and tyranny uh, for the next video. Um, so, yeah, so we had Tim Ar Okay, so the, the basic outline here is we got, like, constitutions on this side and individuals in this column. And then in the rows, we've got aristocracy with, like, the, the just city and the just man. And in that person, you got reason and appetites controlling, or reason and the spiritedness controlling the appetites. And then, because they don't do proper, like, population planning... Um, they devolve into timocracy, which is a society ruled by the love of honors. Um, and yeah, they, I guess they're just like always stri like trying to win these contests and things. Um, but the problem is that or you, have, you have kind of the soldiers get in charge um, or the ones who just love like kind of not the good soldiers, but like the honor loving soldiers. But then they start like spending money on the sly and. Um, and so that kind of leads to the downfall of the Tim Timocracy. And then on the individual side, you had this interesting story of like the mom complaining to her kid about her husband. You're like, oh yeah, your dad's just a pushover. And then the kid is like, yeah, I don't want to be no pushover. I'm going to let the spirited element in me rule. Uh, and so he starts seeking honors um, and going to the gym a lot. Uh, and then that collapses because on the uh, one hand, we had the, the, Tim, the Timarchs, I guess, Timocrats. Uh, they, they wanted to start spending money, so they allowed themselves to spend money and change the laws and then introduce like this uh, property requirement. And then they ultimately become an oligarchy because uh, only like the rich people are in charge anymore. And then similarly, we have like this next generation of the individual, his dad, the Timocrat, was like wanted honors too much and ultimately either gets killed or has all his possessions taken away because he's like a general and I guess he's just like getting a little bit too proud um, or makes, makes some kind of like risky move or whatever. I don't know. Something bad happens. So he's thrown into poverty and he's like, I'm not going to be like you, dad. I'm gonna, always going to have money. And that's what the oligarchs do. They just, like, save up their money, and they don't spend their money. Um, so they have all these poor people around. They got, like, these uh, beggars and evildoers in the city. And then at the individual level, you got the beggar appetite and the evildoing appetite. And he's trying to keep them under control, but it's kind of unsuccessful because he's not actually using reason. Uh, he's using fear. And so he's still got these appetites. And Socrates is saying... When this individual is spending other people's money, he's happy to, like, uh, feed feed those appetites. Uh, so he really doesn't have this, like, harmonious uh, soul inside. And next, I guess we're going to show how this uh, oligarchy collapses, both at the societal level and the individual level. And it's I guess it's going to become a democracy. Uh, so we'll, we'll get kind of the fourth generation over here and then the next incarnation of society and look forward to the best-selling intergenerational novel about all this. Uh, okay, so that's um, that, that was that. Uh, this is kind of a fun chapter, uh, not nearly as heady as the stuff about, like, oh, true thought and the good and the line and the no, no knowledge and uh, opinion and belief and uh, all this, the dialectic and all this stuff. Uh, so I'm kind of glad we got away from that. This is a nice, like, little, little breather with some relatable stories. Um, and as for the wider meaning of these things, I don't really know yet. Um, I'll have to get through the other two and then decide. So if you enjoyed this video, hit the old thumb up button down below, uh, hit the share button, uh, share the playlist with somebody, um, who might enjoy philosophy as much as you apparently do for getting to the end of book eight or the end of the beginning of book eight here at Plato's Republic. See you next time.